welcome to the Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast. We am here today with Simon Crosby, the CTO of Bromium. Hello, Simon, and welcome. Hello, Ed. Good to be back. And I want to do something a little bit differently. Normally, I'm talking about enterprise security, but today I've really been trying to do a series on security for consumers, those things we can do this year, this season, to protect ourselves, our family, our children, and basically our money, our life, our digital life, to protect us from attack and protect us from theft. So last week, um, I was on the call with Mike, and we did a lot of things like use a, sing, a, pass, a, a one password or some other type of password holder. Don't leave packages outside. Don't you put those big boxes or small boxes out on the curb, crush them up, do whatever you need. More like that. And what do you have in mind that a consumer can do while they're traveling or for this season to protect themselves? So I have this very simple analogy but that is i think that as consumers as individuals we're pretty good at individual security wherever we are you know you don't walk down skanky alleyways you know as the only person at night you just don't do it right okay and so the thing to do is to try and think about the internet as being a place with skanky alleyways. it has some great places well lit malls and everything else and has some skanky alleyways and so i think if if you can, in your online presence, try and do as you would do in the physical world, you'll be in a pretty good shape. So let's put it this way. You know, Ed, you and I go back a long way and we're yes. good friends, but I'm still not going to tell you my bank account number and, and my password. Right? I'm just not going to do it. And I wouldn't do that, you know, if we're sitting opposite each other in Starbucks. And I'm not going to do it if I get the email which says, you know, hey, you know, let's... Uh, just click here because it's, you know, it's Starbucks. Well, you know. and to be honest, I wouldn't ask you. <laughs> no, you I wouldn't. I don't want to know. And, I don't want that no, responsibility. And, and so that's the point. And so given that we know that none of our friends would ever ask us to do stupid things in the physical world, when we get emails that ask us to do inherently stupid things, we shouldn't click on them, right? Or we shouldn't respond to them. So, and so the model is basically, unless you have some tool out there in the, in, in the consumer world that doesn't exist, don't click on something that you don't understand. Yeah, so even if it looks, if it looks plausible, right? You know, even then, the, that's no guarantee that it's that it's real, right? It, now, that is point, anybody. Pay, it, case in point, PayPal has been sent. I've been getting a huge amount of mail from PayPal. Yeah, right. It looks like a PayPal message. It has all the PayPal logos, but it's not from PayPal. Exactly. And so, the one thing to know is that no reputable online merchant would ever do anything like that. Yeah, they would right. never say change your password. They never send an email asking you to do that sort of stuff with a URL embedded in it, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, wherever you can, and most of them support this now, two-factor authentication is a great idea, Absolutely. right? So, for example, even Amazon supports it and so on. So, in general, the more of these things you can adopt, um, you should. It's just better. Well, if you see something that looks plausible, it's better off instead of clicking in the email, go direct to the site and make sure things are right. Hey, so I have another crazy one for you. Um, you know, I have kids, young kids, what, 10 and 8. Don't tell and me you so, got hit by VTAC. <laughs> no, but I wanted to have them have the opportunity to completely ditch their identities, their online identities, because it's starting to do Minecraft and all that stuff by the time they get to 18, say, all right? That is, I don't want them to be completely mined and everything else by mm -hmm. Facebook and Google and everybody else. So how would you solve that problem? That's quite interesting, right? So I've got this whole, I'm trying to set up this whole thing, which is essentially an ability for them to have online identities, which they can arbitrarily jettison as they, you know, when they get to a certain point, you know, in their lives, and have all of that history just uh, disappear. That's a fun one. It's an interesting technical problem. It's a very interesting, but it's technically possible. It's not easy. I knew one guy that wanted to create the um, the automatic tool for removing yourself from any service. Yes, and, and so the problem here is, what's the identifier? 
Well, well, what's the identifier that the online service knows you by, right? And how do how do how does this all happen? Anyway, so I've you know I've ditched Google in all forms, um, and I've moved them up. They have Office three sixty five identities, but we cycle through them and we ditch them. I have a bunch of scripts which throw that stuff away, and uh, yeah, we'll see. It's an interesting experiment. Well, you and I need to talk about that one offline at some point in time. But yeah, if you can, if you have multiple identities in your so children, <clears throat> the problem with online identities, unless you can jettison them, they live forever. Yeah. So one of the other things that I do is on, online is um, I don't put anything personal out online. I don't, my wife's name is not known online. I also Google hack myself to look up my ID, my usernames online to see where they show up and if they show up in odd places. Yeah, so the interesting, you know, so Microsoft has a service now associated with Azure ID, Azure AD. So if you use Azure Active Directory, um, they do that for you as a service. That mm -hmm. is, if they see your credentials being used around the world in places that they shouldn't be, then they're going to scream. And that's a good thing, actually. So Microsoft actually offering security services for Azure, I think it's pretty, it's a good step for them and finally they're starting to sell security uh, services that's so if you that's have office 365 which uses azure you may be able to use this feature yeah you might yeah. they also do uh atp so um if there is a, a skew in office 365 where if you open so if you open an attachment in office 365 in the cloud then it opens in a vm in azure Yes. Okay. And it blows up there. And if they see something bad, they're going to tell you about it. They do relatively simple things today. But anyway, so they're starting to do some good things. And of course, they've been buying other security companies, Adalarm recently and and so on. So I think you know, that's an interesting path forward. And that's actually almost 100% consumer in a lot of ways. Um, well, it's that's it's not both. what... That's not who they're selling it to. Oh, wait, I guess you... Could, I wonder if you could buy it as a consumer. I've, I've I've set my Office 365 world up as a small business, but it's just me and my family. Um, Which but is nonetheless, really yeah, because then you get to subscribe to all the premium things, but you still you're going to pay for it a bit, right? But I I think it's worth it. So I mean, so far, I mean, if you can get the services, I would go for that as well. Um, but if you can't, go on Bing, go on Google, and look for yourself. You'll be shocked yeah. by what you find. Well, we, actually, we've split up slightly differently. My wife does all the Facebook stuff because we have people all around the world who are friends and family, right? Um, but she has a very closely and well-managed uh, profile in terms of who her friends are and who gets to see what. And I do none of it. I'm a bit like you. I use Facebook for business personally and I'm trying to train people like my mom no longer uses it and a few other people just don't well, use it. But the thing is, is that it doesn't keep you from communicating with people. That's the point. So, I, I mean, I, I'm not in favor of doing things which are actively going to mess up your life. And we do live these horribly distributed lives and our friends are all over the place. So if there are tools that make your life better, that's fine. Just be aware of the fact that, you know, you have to be very somebody who's savvy in terms of managing the distribution of information and uh you know, amongst your so-called friends needs to be in charge of the settings. And you need to pay attention to those settings because they change often. So I'm assuming your wife yeah, goes through right. once a month or so to look at them. Yeah. Yep, that came That actually has been one of the things. The big one is, you know, what I don't do is you really, for children, you really shouldn't be publishing photos of your children online at any time. You can do it for friends as long as you know your privacy settings, but putting them on Twitter is kind of foolish. <sighs> Never do anything on Twitter that you care about. <laughs> Twitter's, Never. In, Twitter's that open conference room, open call. Twitter is, a bar. A, a, Twitter is a bar at the end of the skanky dark alleyway. <laughs> Full of people, you walk in, half of them are drunk, and you yell at the top of your voice. That's, that's Twitter. It is Twitter, but in, it's one of those things that a lot of people use. But don't do anything silly there. If you want to talk to someone, it's not a great place to hold a conversation. It's not even a good place. You know, Twitter's notion of direct messages, you know, like, would you trust Twitter to keep that stuff private? No. Yeah. Would you trust people on Twitter to keep that stuff private? No. So don't do it, right? 
Yeah. Well, Twitter itself is not private. So and that's what people need to realize is that their privacy is in their hands. And they need to control yeah. it. Yeah. That's I mean, right. Another good one is online banking. It's like you don't online bank from bad locations. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, for example, what I do with online banking is I have a, I actually use a wired connection. I have a virtual machine that does all my online banking, and I've locked it down six ways to Sunday in my own Ed, environment. Ed, you need Bromium, my friend. I will get you some. <laughs> I do need Bromium, but I won't, put on, I won't bank from my iPhone. I won't bank from my iPad. I'll first log into the secure container, and then from there, bank. So I keep all my banking in one place, kind of a well-known, well-secured location. It's kind of like going up to the, the teller. You're not going to do it in the middle. of the. You know, it, it, this is another thing. If you're going to go up to a teller, make sure no one's watching you type in your pen. Look around. I mean, there's a few places I've, ban I, I've thought about banking that I've refused to because the teller's out in the middle of a lobby within line of sight from everybody. And you can see the keypad from everywhere. It's yep. not wise to use, do that. So pick a different location or go to the teller so you don't have to worry about that. Although, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's all bound down to reasonableness. And, and what's what's the risk of loss? And what's the, I mean, that you have to do that some, right? When someone gets your PIN and debit hey, card you're in, number, you're, you're going to lose all your money. Yeah, you're in deep, in bad shape. You're in bad shape. So you got to be really <laughs> careful how you do that. Um, some, I mean, the, the readers that they have now that the attackers have are incredibly small. So I always look at the slot in which the credit card's going into for anything that looks even the remotest abnormal compared to everything else I've seen. Yep. I think chip and chip and chip and sign even is a good step forward there. I mean, Absolutely. America's chip slowly being dragged into the 1960s. <laughs> Well, now chip and sign is actually really big. Um, people that think chip and pin is better, you got to be watch out for those fees from your credit card company because it acts as a cash transaction instead of a credit transaction. So you need to be worried about that as well. So if you're going to do chip and pin, it's better off with your debit card. Chip and sign is better off for a credit card, depending yeah. on where you are around the world. That's right. And the bank, check it out know what you are getting into insist on at least a chip a card with the chip in it that'll help helps a lot well even though a lot some of these the chip technologies have been broken but it takes access to the card reader right now yeah i mean look ultimately anything that raises the bar for the attacker is a good thing and that raises the bar very very considerably so it's a good thing Yes. So when you're going shopping, you're going to pay with the with a, a credit device. Use that. Actually, mm -hmm. my wife only pays with cash. She doesn't use her credit cards or debit cards anyway, which is rather intriguing. By the way, I saw this fascinating story about purchasing online health insurance. So it always used to be the case if you were purchasing private health insurance that they would send a doctor around your house and take yes. blood samples and all that stuff, right? Nowadays, they'll do that without any of that. And that's because they bought all of your social data plus your credit card history. And they've analyzed it all according to your consumption habits. And they can make a bid without actually having to send someone to your house. That's pretty awesome. I mean, it's pretty scary. Well, it's pretty Good scary for them. that they know that you travel to Zimbabwe and say, eh, you're at risk. <laughs> yes, or you go to the bar every night and you pay with your credit card or something. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the problem is we have a digital life and no one knows how to manage it. That's right. And we need to start doing that. We need to start paying attention. Just like you, as you said at the beginning, the skanky alleyway. Most of the digital life, much of the stuff we do online is not all that safe. And we think somebody else is protecting us. And the thing is, no one else is. Well, actually, it's worse than that. Most people in the online world have an incentive to do the opposite. I mean, arguably, I mean, Google is not trying to be evil, but for example, they're trying to send you advertisements that might be relevant to you, and therein is already an, an invasion of your privacy, right? Yes. 
it's it's relatively minor and they're trying to do the right thing but you know even then they can deliver you sure malware not, dismiss i'm not sure it's minor let's say you have a family computer and your wife is looking up some things and the ads show up for the husband that could be an invasion of privacy as well so it all is yeah yeah um or the cases of where the daughter's looking up stuff and she wanted to surprise her parents with news yeah exactly news right ahead of ahead of time that's not good either yeah you know then you you have to have consenting parties in all of this and unfortunately you don't consent to google it's kind of a click where click wrap and you got to read this stuff before you click and unfortunately you can't read it until you click yeah you can't read the terms of service in these things it's just ridiculous hey so here's an interesting fact for you so you know <clears throat> the ad funded web right so we have this idea that the advertisers pay right they yes. pay google and we get this web actually do you know who pays you do yeah. so let me tell you how you pay i mean not just through the surfacing of the ads uh, we recently looked at the memory requirements and the performance impact of advertisements on end user compute devices. And it turns out that basically 60% of the cost of delivering ads is borne by you through the hardware that you have to use to receive the stuff and view it. So, for example, you go to some website, I don't know, CNBC or something, and all these flash ads start to play, right? Yep. That bloats, so the additional RAM that you require is massive, right? The, the browser is hugely performance taxi on any machine. And so it turns out that in reality, if you turn all that stuff off, so if all flash is just click to play, and, um, you know, and, and if the browser is limited in terms of the number of places of contacts and so on, that you cut the total resource cost by about 6%. That's Isn't that huge. amazing? That it's huge. Is. So if you think you have a virus, you may actually just have ads. <laughs> yeah, but it could be a virus delivered by an ad. Well, absolutely. <laughs> so make all those ads or all those movies click to play, and there's some tools you can add into browsers to remove ads and things like that, all these ad blockers that are coming out. That's actually huge right now. Yeah. But make sure you get one from a reputable company. You don't want to just get one from one of those um, um, little carts in the middle of the mall that shows up on Christmas and leaves the next day. You want to get one from a rep reputable store that you can, whether online or not, that you can actually go back to and say, fix it if it's broken. Yep. So that's that's a good thing. That's a good thing to keep in mind. That whole would you buy from them for something that you needed to use to help your family that you wanted to use for a while to protect your family, you wouldn't. Right. So that's something you would do on the internet as well, is pay attention to that. That's a very good point. So today so today we've gone over don't walk down the skanky alleyways of the internet. Try to recognize them. Have that situational awareness of what's around you. Yeah. You've also gone down this thing, which is, the, you know, no reputable party that you interact with is going to ask, going to send you an email saying, click here to, to, to change your password, right? They just don't do it. Or in a lot of them, don't, don't, in a lot of them won't say, oh, please click on this, this document. It's like, no, they will tell you what's in it and they won't provide it. They'll provide some other means to get it. Yeah. If you think something's coming from a bank on a do in a document, the chances are that's not right. They have other Hey, means. oh, you know what happened to me the other day? I was working at home, and I got this phone call from a very nice gentleman. He was clearly Indian, but um, he claimed to be from Microsoft. And he told me that I had lots of malware coming from my computer. Okay, I've seen this also at my mom's house. And so, you know, good old, I had a lot of fun with him. I kept him on the phone for an hour while I was doing other work. And eventually got him to poke around inside microbeams and he was getting very, very, very confused because he couldn't see what I was seeing and everything else. But basically he pointed me at a bunch of remediation stuff, which was going to download malware. And then when that failed, he pointed me at some, um, some tools would give him a remote RDP style access to my device. So, um, you know, the whole bunch of free utilities allow you to do that a lot, like log me in and so on. 
and he was getting into my machine and trying to drop malware and, and, and mess with settings, okay? So be aware of people who phone you saying that they're from a reputable dealer and your machine is broken, can they help you fix it? Just tell them to take a hike um, because it's always BS. And they don't have all the protections you have. I mean, most consumers do not. And they don't, right? Get some of that even as a consumer, so that's not a, that's not a problem. Don't do this. So, yeah, I mean, I actually have gotten physical mail that's been spam. I've gotten phone calls six ways a Sunday that are spam, and people doing exactly what that. They call you up and say, hey, you got a problem. I'm here to solve it. It's like, no, <laughs> don't. Don't click on, don't answer, don't give them access, don't do anything like that. It's just a bad yeah. idea. And then upgrade your upgrade your software. Keep it up to date. Yeah. Absolutely. So those are our you know, items. It's been about 20 minutes, but that's actually fine. Is there anything else you'd like to add for the consumers that they need to do? I think it's pretty good, you know. I think, uh, I think we're getting better at it. You know, move on. That's the key thing. Move on, move up. Keep your software up to date. Keep patching. Keep your eyes open. I think keeping your eyes open is the key one. And that's actually the one where we need to learn from each other. I made this mistake. Don't make it with me. Yeah. You don't want to be in that same situation. Learn from everybody else's mistakes. Make your own. Make new ones. But learn from them. Make sure. Yeah, so the, the whole thing here is relative trust. You can never know whether something is perfectly trustworthy. <clears throat> True. Um, but if you keep your eyes open, you can do pretty well. So EL Doctor has this really good way of saying this, which is, um, you know, it, it can be misty and everything else. So I'm trying to remember the quote exactly. But, you know, you can only see as far as the headlights show you, but you, which is limited, but you can make the whole journey that way. Absolutely. And that's it. Thank you very much for joining me, Simon. Pleasure. Great to speak to you again, Ed.